Good morning. Good, good morning. Welcome to the Bow One One tutorial. Today we'll be dealing with proteins. So we'll be having a tutorial sheet on the protein sector. So I'm going to tackle a tutorial sheet on proteins. Our first question for today will be, uh, illustrate the general formula of amino acids and state the functional groups present in all amino acids. So we've been told to illustrate the general formula for amino acids. So meaning this general formula should be able to represent all the amino acids and an amino acid is a basic unit from which proteins are made. So it is a basic unit to form up proteins. I've been told to illustrate the general formula for amino acids. In the amino acids general formula, you're expected to find elements like the nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen and the carbon. So the general formula is for the general formula for the amino acid you have an alpha carbon which is the center carbon this is the alpha carbon, which is attached to the carboxyl group, the hydrogen atom, the amino group, and the aryl group. So this part is called the amino group. Then you have the carboxyl group. Then you also have the R group. And the question further says, we are also supposed to state the functional groups of an amino acid. So the functional group, these are just group of molecules or atoms that give its characteristic functions. So the functional groups in an amino acid are, so functional groups, that you can find in an amino acid. One, you have the amino group. Second one, you have the R group. Thirdly, you have the carboxyl group. The amino group, which is NH2, nitrogen, hydrogen, carboxyl group, COOH. And some people may query to say, why should the R group be considered as one of the functional groups for amino acids? The R group, these are groups of atoms that give an amino acid its uniqueness. So they give an amino acid its uniqueness. That's why we consider the R group as well 
to be a functional group as well. Because having different R groups to make the amino acid to either be polar, non-polar in nature, and also have different characteristics like being ionic. So that's why it is considered as a functional group. So I hope that for the first question is clear, we're asked to state the general structure, the general formula for amino acid, which is being illustrated here. Then we also state the functional groups for the amino acids, which are the amino group, the R group, the carboxyl group. So we'll move on to the next question. The next question states that, with reference to a known amino acid, illustrate the reaction where two amino acids link up to form a dipeptide. So being asked to illustrate a reaction to form a dipeptide. So a dipeptide, that's what we've been asked to form with an illustration of a chemical reaction. So a dipeptide from the term di, it means it has two, not that it has two bonds, but it has two amino acids attached to it. So two amino acids which are attached together. form a dipeptide. And how we're able to form a dipeptide is through the reaction called condensation. So we're going to illustrate the condensation reaction. Why it is called a condensation reaction? Because it involves a removal of a water molecule. So this condensation involves a removal of a water molecule. That's why it is called the condensation reaction. So we're going to illustrate. Illustrate means you draw with an example of an amino acid. That's what the question says. So with respect to an example of an amino acid, a known amino acid. So my known amino acid that I'm going to illustrate or to show the condensation reaction, I'll use glycine. Glycine is the simplest amino acid. That's the amino acid that I'll use because the, the question says with a known amino acid. So you can use any amino acid to show the condensation reaction to form a dipeptide. And since we're forming a dipeptide, it means we're just attaching two amino acids because it is di. Di means two amino acids. So we'll move on to the reaction to illustrate the reaction. The structure of glycine, since we're illustrating, It, is, it has an amino group attached to an alpha carbon and the R group for glycine is hydrogen atom. This is the structure for glycine. So we can show it. So we have an amino group.
let's not forget we're illustrating so we're supposed to label so this is glycine so glycine plus glycine since it's a reaction Glycine plus another glycine giving us it will go the removal of the water molecule. So giving us a dipeptide and that formation where the reaction will be taking place for the removal of a water molecule. It's these two. So you attach. Forming a bond with the nitrogen atom. So this is a dipeptide. And the bond which is formed between two amino acids in the condensation reaction is called a peptide bond. So this is a peptide bond. So this is called a peptide bond. So a peptide bond is a covalent type of bond. When we say covalent, meaning it involves the, sh the sharing of electrons, not the gaining of the losing of electrons, but the sharing of electrons. So this is a covalent bond. And if you look at the dipeptide which has been formed, it leaves room for further combination or attachment of another amino acid. So if you want to attach another amino acid, it leaves room because you have a free, this is a free amino group, which can attach with another amino acid, attaching the carboxy group from another amino acid, as well as this side, you also have a free carboxyl group. Which can attach with, another, with an amino group from another amino acid. So this is our condensation reaction. We've illustrated our condensation reaction since the question said illustrates. Make sure all the known examples that you use, the amino acids are well labeled. Then the type of bond which is formed and showing that it is a dipeptide which has been formed. So we've tackled this question, you can move on to the next question. So the next question says, with examples of amino acids, explain the types of isomerism that exist in amino acids. So the question says, with examples of amino acids, explain the types of isomerism that exist in amino acids. So with respect to the non amino acids that we can use, we expect it to explain the types of isomerisms that are found in amino acids. 
So we move on to the next question. the left something you can also show to say plus a water molecule since the water molecule is removed so this point you show to say plus a water molecule even if you've showed on the other that there will be a removal of a water molecule you also show in your reaction that the water molecule is removed because it is a condensation reaction So we come to the next question. The next question is asking us to uh, state the types of isomerism that exist in amino acids. So isomerism. So on the types of isomerisms that exist in amino acids, we have two main types. One, structural isomerism. The other one is stereoisomerism. So we have structural isomerism and stereoisomerism. These are the main types. So structural isomerism, stereoisomerism. So we'll start explaining on the structural isomerism. I've been taught to say we should use with known examples. So when it comes to structural isomerism, we're going to use uh, alanine or alanine. So I'll explain a bit what structural and structural isomerism are. We will start with our structural isomerism. So structural isomerism, this is a type of isomerism where a compound has same chemical groups which are attached to different carbon atoms. So this is a type of isomerism. By the way, isomerism is just a phenomenon that describes compounds having different kinds of chemical groups but the same uh, structural formula. So we're going to have Structural isomerism, they will have the same chemical groups. Same chemical groups attached to different Then chemical groups attached to different carbon atoms. Meaning, in their structures, they will be having the same chemical groups, but the position of those chemical groups will be on different carbon atoms. So an example of a structural isomerism, we're going to illustrate it using an example of lysine. Going to use the amino acid lysine. 
So lysine has lysine has six carbon atoms in the main structural chain, six carbon atoms. Six carbon atoms in the main structure. So we're going to do a straight, a straight chain of lysine. So we're going to count one, other side So I'm going to illustrate with the main structure of lysine to just show on the position of the chemical groups in the different carbon atoms. So structural isom isomerism, you name them according to the position of the chemical groups on the carbon atoms. So we have alpha lysine. So there's alpha, beta, this is alpha. So we have alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. So for alpha, meaning the carbon atom is on carbon number two. The chemical group is on carbon number two. For it to be considered as alpha lysine, the carbon atom, the, carb, the chemical group is on carbon number two. For beta, the chemical group is on carbon number three. Then gamma, the chemical group is on carbon number four. Delta, the chemical group is on carbon number five. Then epsilon, the chemical group is on carbon number six. Since I'm given an example with regards to lysine, the chemical group that we're going to consider for lysine, it's an amino group. So just rub the top part this side. I hope you've taken notes. So the, chem the chemical group that we're considering for lysine is an amino group. Note this amino group which is at the end of the carbon atom number six. So this is carbon number one, two, three, four, five, six. On carbon number one, why well, we're not considering carbon number one because it carries a functional group. Functional group which is a carboxyl group. 
because of this group, that's why carbon number one is not considered as to be one of the carbon atoms where the chemical groups can position themselves. So I'm only going to consider from carbon number two, three, four, five, six. So if this amino group is on carbon number two, meaning this is called alpha lysine. So the name for this structure will be alpha lysine. If, it's, if it will be on carbon number three, So this one will be considered as beta lysine or beta lysine. When you move on to another one, from carbon number four it will be gamma lysine. So when naming them, you can either use the symbols, these are the symbols, or the names. If you are not sure how you are supposed to write the symbols, because for beta, if you write a B symbol, then it's wrong. So you are supposed to know how the symbols are written. If you don't know how to write the symbols, then it's better to use the names. You can write alpha lysine, so it can be named alpha lysine. That is if you're not sure about the name. So you can move on whilst you're moving the chemical group, because this is the chemical group. And this chemical group is the R group for lysine. So this is the R group. So as you move the R group for lysine, it's also giving you a different kind of name. So these, all these two, four, five, the structural isomers of each other because of the position of the amino group, which is the R group for lysine. So if it moves on to carbon number five, the name changes from gamma lysine to delta lysine until you reach the sixth one, which is epsilon lysine. So this is it on structural isomerism with an example of lysine, which has six carbon atoms in its structure. And with regard, you consider again, carbon number one should not be considered because it is the functional group, which is a boxy group. So you cannot start attach the R group on the carbon number one. So this is it on structural isomerism. We'll move on to stereoisomerism. So I hope you've taken note of the structures. So again, I was just leaving it open on the other side because you can attach the hydrogen atoms. I was trying to concentrate on the movement of the R group, which is the amino group for lysine, not this amino group, 
there is another amino group in its structure whereby the position is moving. So we can move on to structural isomerism or to steroid isomerism. So for steroid isomerism, there are different types of steroid isomerism. And this is what is steroid isomerism. For steroid isomerism is where uh, different compounds, they have the same It means the same, we use same or identical chemical groups. Identical chemical groups with different orientation. in space. So you have identical chemical groups with different orientation of atoms in space. And the structure is also the same. So the chemical structure will be the same but having different orientations of atoms in space. So they will have the same chemical structure, different orientation of atoms in space. How we are going to illustrate steroid isomerism, we'll use an example of, so the example that we're going to look at, we're going to use alanine, you can call it alanine or alanine. So amino acid for steroid isomerism illustration, we use alanine amino acid. So we're going to use alanine, so we're going to illustrate. consider is that different types of steroid isomerism, there is one which talks about the cis and trans, then there is also another one which talks about enantiomers. Enantiomers, meaning mirror images, they are mirror images. So the one that we are going to look at is enantiomers. So we're going to consider this one, which is number two. With an example of alanine. Alanine has an R group. The R group for alanine is CH3. That's the R group for alanine. So for steroisomers, we're looking at the same chemical groups with different orientation of atoms in space. And the atoms in space that we're going to consider in this case in steroisomerism is the R group. So the position of the R group the position of the R group in the chemical structure. So 
So considering the position of the R group in the chemical structure, and in this case for alanine, or alanine is CH3. That's the R group for alanine. So we're going to look at the two types of alanine. With the position, you have to consider whether it is on the left side, left side of the structure, or the right side of the structure. So we're looking at the position of the R group, whether it is on the left side of the structure or, or the right side of the structure. So now we have to look at the left side of the structure or the right side of the structure. So if it is on the left side of the structure, which is the R group, and in this case for alanine, or alanine is CH3, then it means it will be called L alanine or alanine. If it is on the right side of the structure, which is the R group, the R group, if it's on the right side of the structure, then it will be called D alanine. So since we've explained or I'm trying to understand what we're looking at, so that is on the left side, left side or the right side of the structure, since we're looking at the position of the R group in the chemical structure for alanine. So if it's left side, L, then if it's right side, D. So now we can illustrate the structures. So we can look at the structures since we're trying to illustrate the structures. So we'll start with the so the alanine. So, Also look at another one. So we are having the functional group, we are still in the same question. Which is talking about isomerism. So this is the R group for alanine. This one, so this is the R group. So the position of the R group, we look at the one which is on the left side. This one is on the left side, so meaning this is L. L9. Then this one, since it's on the right side, it's D. L9. And we 
said the nation has meaning the mirror images of each other. So with the reflection of this should be able to give you the, the structure for L alanine. The reflection of L alanine should give you the structure of D alanine. So this is the illustration for stereoisomerism with an example of alanine. So I hope it's clear. We can move on to the next question. So the next question the next question says explain what is meant by primary structure, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures of proteins and relate every structural level to their functions. So explain what is meant by primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure of proteins and relate every structure, structural level to their functions. So we're going to start with the simplest, which is primary structure. So we're looking at the description of proteins. These proteins can be classified with regards to structural level. So we'll look at the structural level, composition, And the functional or the function. And this question is asking us to talk about the structure. So the structural levels of proteins. So there are four types of uh, structural levels of proteins. There are four types. So the structural levels. There are four types, such as primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. And we've been told to explain on the types of structural levels of proteins. So we're going to start with the primary structure. The primary structure of proteins is just the sequence, the sequence of amino acids. in a polypeptide chain. A sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide chain. Remember we looked at a dipeptide. Polypeptide means having thousands of amino acids attached to each other. That's a polypeptide chain. So a sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide chain. And this sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide chain, it is attached with the use of, or the bonds which are found in the sequence is a peptide bond. So you find a peptide bond in its sequence. Apart from that, as it is a long chain of polypeptides, with an example, this is your chain, so some chains can just be like that. Having an amino acid, these circles represent amino acids attached to each other. Or the chain can fold itself. It is still a sequence, but it's not folding itself in a 
very special way, it's just a simpler pattern. And as it folds itself, you find that some amino acids will have non-polar molecules. Non-polar R groups. And these non-polar R groups, they'll be able to form a bond which is called, or a bridge, diasulfide. Bond. How they do that? Sorry, I'm just diasulfide. Just a correction on that one. So just a correction on that one. So as they fought, let me talk about the cis, the system before I move on to the next part. The system amino acid. The system amino acid with another system amino acid plus another system. They form those sulfide bridges. The sulfide bridges or the sulfide bonds. How are they able to form the sulfide bridges? Because these cysteine amino acids they have what is called They have the sulfabryl groups, which is SH. So with the composition or with it having the sulfabryl groups, they are able to form the sulfide bridges, the system molecules, and they are able to form that in this primary structure. So you have your protein structure, and an example at this position, they have the sulfabryl groups, they are bond with another one, on this point, so you find that in the primary primary structure of the protein, you have peptide bonds, and you also have the sulfide the sulfide bonds. So there are two types of bonds in the sequence of the amino acid, which is the primary structure. So an example of a protein which can exist in a primary structure is insulin. So this is the example of the primary structure of the protein, which is insulin. And the other thing that you should consider, the question says, and also talk about the function. On the functional part, it's trying to ask how does this contribute to the function of the protein? The sequence of amino acids in the polypeptide chain contributes to the primary function of the protein in that if you disrupt this sequence of amino acids, so if I disrupt it here, let's say at this point, instead of having a particular amino acid that is supposed to be there, I put a different one, or I just remove it completely, the function of this protein will change. An example with such cases or such proteins is sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is due to the disruptiveness of the protein structure, which is the primary structure of that protein. And you find that instead of the red blood cells being having a normal form or the normal shape, they'll have a flattened disc type of shape. So the red blood cell, carries 
produce oxygen in the blood, meaning it transports the oxygen in the blood. And if the shape changes from its normal shape to a disc one, it won't carry its full amount of oxygen that it's supposed to carry because of changing shape. And this happens to the primary structure of the protein. So the disruptiveness of that sequence will change the function of that primary structure or that primary protein. So to answer part of the question, we can move on to the secondary structure with an example. So I've talked about the example of a sickle cell in relation to how the function can be affected. We can move on to the next one, which is the secondary structure. So the secondary structure The secondary structure of the protein, this is the interaction, the interaction of the amino acids the interaction of amino acids in the sequence of those amino acids. So it's just the interaction of amino acids in the sequence of the polypeptide chain. So the interactions of amino acids in the sequence of the polypeptide chain and these interactions that we're talking about under the secondary structure level of the proteins are the hydrogen the hydrogen bonds. And these hydrogen bonds are formed between the hydrogen atom the hydrogen atom of the hydroxyl group or the amine group so these interactions, which are the hydrogen bonds, are formed between the hydrogen atom of the hydroxyl group and the amine or the amine group with the oxygen atom from the carboxyl group. So the hydrogen bonds are formed between the hydrogen atom of the hydroxyl group or the amine group in the polypeptide chain of the protein molecule with the oxygen atom from the carboxyl group in the polypeptide chain. So an example of those secondary level of proteins are the alpha helix. and the beta pleated sheet. So these are the examples of the structural, the secondary structural levels of proteins, the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheets. So for the alpha helix, it will call so this is alpha helix. This coiling is called is caused because of the interactions of the amino acids in the polypeptide chain forming hydrogen bonds. So meaning the amino acid at this point it will hydrogen bond with the hydrogen atom. Let's attach this side. So 
So same applies with problem. To bond with the hydrogen atom from the amine group. So these are the hydrogen bonds. So because of that, those hydrogen bonds, they're able to keep up the stability of the secondary structure of the primary, of the proteins, sorry. So they're able to keep up with the stability of the secondary structure of the proteins, the hydrogen bonds. So if, if you disrupt the hydrogen bonds, because hydrogen bonds are weak bonds, meaning they're able to reform and be broken at a faster rate, if you disrupt the hydrogen bonds, meaning its secondary function is also disrupted. So what gives up the stability is because of the hydrogen bonds. With the examples of the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheets. So for today, we'll end here. We'll continue with the question asking us on uh, illustrating and with examples and regard of the functions for the structural levels of proteins such as the tertiary and the quaternary will continue on Friday at 10 to 11 hours this week. Thank you for today. Have a blessed day.